In this trilogy, it is all about Nina, and I will guide you from your very first steps and the installation to creating complex sequences. So in this first part, we talk about the installation of Nina, the connection to all your equipment, and your first steps with Nina. And you might ask, why don't you sit comfortably on your chair where I usually sit, but stand beside my rig? Because Nina has all to do with the rig. It's the partner. So you could say Nina is the software that rules it all. And in the shadow, no, no that, that's another trilogy. Anyway, so let's go back. What is Nina? Nina is in principle an automation software. It automates your shooting nights so that you can go to sleep or play PlayStation or watch a movie or whatever, but that you don't have to stand beside the rig. Now you might say, is this really that complicated? And let's think about it. What do we need that we can peacefully go to sleep besides being sure that there's a rig? We need to control the mount. On one side that it's loose to the right target, on the other side that we're sure that it follows the target. So we need a guide scope, a guide cam, we need some guiding software, and this has to be controlled again, for example for the dithering. Then we need to have control over our camera, that it's cooled the right way, that it makes the photos that we want. We might need to change filters from time to time. We need to ensure that we're always in focus. For example, when we change filters, for example, when the temperature changes, we need to control our dew heaters, the power source. So you see, there's a multitude of decisions that have to be made throughout the night. And if we don't want to do it, we need some software who does it. Now, you might have heard of the ASI Air and you go like, so why should I go with Nina? But it's not per se that you should, that's not what I'm saying, but you might be forced to, or you might prefer it. So to use an ASI Air, first of all, you need a mount that is compatible with the ASI Air, and you need all your gear, your camera, your focuser, your filter wheel, all need to be from SWO. In my case, that would actually be Possible, but it was not possible before with my CPC 800 because that refused to work with the ASI Air. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is with the ASI Air, you kind of locked in a system. Either you like it or you don't like it. With Nina, you're much more open. There's a lot of plugins, a lot of things you can change however you want it. With ASI Air, you control it either with your cell phone or with a tablet. With Nina, you control it with a computer, also remotely. But still, it's a different device. Some like this better, some like the other better. Nina is free. That doesn't mean that it comes for free, because normally you would also like to use it remotely. And if you want to use it remotely, you need a mini PC. And that also costs around 250 bucks. So for that, you can also buy the ASI Air. So I would say from a price point of view, they're both about the same. So the bottom line is, it's not that Nina or the ASI Air is better. First of all, it's a question of taste. Second of all, for certain setups, the ASI Air just doesn't work. So we will now leave the rig, go to the computer, and there I will explain you everything from the installation to your first steps in Nina. So, welcome to my computer. Before we actually go into Nina, let's look a few things in the browser. And the first thing is obviously the homepage of Nina. Nina, the name is Nighttime Imaging Astronomy. And here in this homepage, we can actually download it. For that, we go to download. At the moment, version 2.2 is out and you can download it. And it's only available for Windows, so no Mac. And at the beginning, I was a little bit upset about that, but actually, given that I usually use it remotely, you need a mini computer. <laughs> and even I love my Mac Mini for doing all the processing. 
it's probably not the right computer to put on a rig. So you need a little Windows mini computer. And so yeah, anyway, we have Windows. In addition to that, you find down here the Sky Atlas image repository and the offline sky map cache. Please also download both of them. One gives you nice little pictures of the objects you're looking for, and the other actually in the offline sky map gives you the whole background so that you can actually frame the objects that you want. So both of them are very important and you should download them. If you go over to documentation, you find the manual and in the manual, you actually find the requirements. And the requirements are really low. So a mini computer will fulfill all of that easy. Now it gets more interesting down here when we look at recommended and optional support software. And the good part is it provides you even the links here. So what you obviously need is ASCOM, which is the interface actually to communicate to your gear. So you don't get around that. And then you definitely need some guiding software. Usually this is PHD2. There's also MetaGuide guiding, never used that. So most people use the PHD2. And if you have not yet used it, please download it. Then for a lot of things, Nina uses plate solving. And it actually can use two different solutions. One as the primary and one as the secondary. A plate solving solution if one or the other actually fails. The most common ones to use are ASTAP and plate solve too. Then you can also connect it to a planetarium application. What is much more important here is the Sky Atlas image data and that's what I refer to on the download page that you get this data. And then you have actually the planetarium software within Nina. When it comes to the plate solving, we can actually look for a second at it. Here in Plane Wave Instruments, you find here Plate Solve 2. So that's one you can download. And here in ASTAP homepage, you can download it here. And you also have to download here this star database. So that's absolutely needed because that's what it really needs to plate solve. So it's the, it's the software plus the database. You have to download and then just follow the install instructions. In addition to all of that, you also need to download the ASCOM drivers for all your gear that you're using. If you use something very mainstream, especially from a camera point of view, for example, a CWO camera, then Nina has already the driver included. But anyway, it's a good idea, especially if the manufacturers have a native ASCOM driver, that you also download that and install that, just to be sure. Once all of that is done, we can now actually go to Windows and open Nina. The first thing that Nina does when you start it up is it confronts you with a profile. And if you leave it on default and you don't add any profiles, then what's actually included here is always the gear that last time you used, all the settings of last time. But you can, and we will look at that, create more profiles, which is actually interesting if, for example, you have two different rigs and you use Nina with both rigs, or you have two different telescopes on your rig. Then you can actually choose here, whichever you want, and then you click low profile. Now with softwares, we're mostly used having the icons and the menu points in a horizontal manner. Now Nina is here a little bit the rebel and has everything in a vertical manner, <laughs> but you get used to that very soon. So I have actually two menu layers. This is the main menu layer. Here you have equipment. So here you can activate all your equipment. You have Sky Atlas, framing, Flat Wizard, Sequencer, Imaging, Options, and Plugins. And then whatever you select, you get here a second line with many item points. And with that, then you influence what you see here. So for the start, let's go to Options and let's start on top with General. So up here you have the different profiles. Personally, I never really cared about profiles as I always had the same rig. This might change now, so I might really take care of this. Whatever the profile is, you have selected. 
I could now, for example, call it FRA 400. So whatever I now change in this session, when I exit it, it will save it. And if I now, for example, want to do another one for the CPC 800, I can click on that, duplicate it. Now I say load profile, and now the other one is active, so I can call it CPC 800. And now I can change everything for the CPC 800, and then I have actually two, and I can change at the start for whatever telescope and rig that I'm using. I can change the language if I want to. And then the next important thing is you see here, Sky Atlas Image Folder and Sky Survey Cache Folder. So these two things you download it beside the install file for Nina. You can put it wherever you want, but then you actually have to tell Nina here where it is. And by the way, if you only have one rig, and you always use the same, then you can actually also disactivate here this profile chooser at startup and it doesn't bother you anymore. In the section here below, you can actually choose two different color schemes, one for day, for example, and one for night. You have a lot of presets, whatever you like. I usually leave it at the default one, or you can even actually change everything yourself. And the same you can do for the alternative color scheme. If I want to activate that, I go down here to the bottom left and I click this little eye icon. And this will now be the dark setup when you write at the shooting. And also here you could change that. Below you have the astrometry, the side latitude, longitude, the side elevation, and what you can actually enter here, which is pretty cool, is a custom horizon. So when you always shoot from the same place that you know where the horizon is and where it is blocked. These coordinates are also correctly imported from your telescope once you connect it. So let's go now to equipment. Also here a lot of things are imported when you're actually connecting your equipment. So for example, the pixel slice of your camera, the Bayer pattern, the bit depth, that's all stuff that is actually imported from your camera. The same is here with the filter wheel. With the telescope, you actually have to enter it manually. So here, my ASCAR, 400 millimeters. Please also remember if you use a reducer, you would have to correct that based on that. The focal ratio, 5.6, and the settle time after slew. So how long it actually should wait after slewing until it makes a photo that you enter here. I would recommend to at least leave it by five seconds so that it is absolutely still. Below here, you can enter your planetarium software and the weather. For the weather, you could actually, from each of these providers, get an API key and then enter it here. And then you could also use the weather. As this is anyway very unreliable, I don't really see the point here. So the next point is autofocus and I have to disappoint you here. We will not cover that in this tutorial. Autofocus is rather a big topic. It is crucial that the setup is done correctly. And there are absolutely great tutorials out there already who explain that in detail. Next comes the dome. And if you own a dome, then first of all, congratulations, must be amazing. And second of all, most likely then you know much, much better than me how to fill all of this in. Next here's something crucial again, imaging that applies for everybody. So the first thing you have to decide is how you want to save the images as, either as FITS, as TIFF, or as XISF, so the file system of PixInsight. If you're stacking in PixInsight, use XISF. If you're not stacking in PixInsight, use FITS. Do not use TIFF in any case. Next, you can save where you actually want to store your images. And then you can actually state how your files should be labeled. And that looks really complicated, but actually there's a very good list down here. At the moment it's date, minutes, then image date, then filters, and so on. So this is the default and I left that. But if you want to have other things in there, in a file name, which are crucial to you, you can do that. On the right side here, we can define everything about the meridian flip, when it should be done, how it should be done. 
Then we have some image options and just activate here everything. And we will come in the plugin section then to the Hocus Focus. Next, we have here some settings about the sequencer and we deal with that when we actually talk about sequences. Now, the last point here that we have is plate solving. As stated, there are two different solutions you can use. Once you have installed it, I use here plate solve 2 as my default plate solver. And for the blind solver, so if plate solve 2 fails, I use ASTAP. So down here, I have then to go to ASTAP and I have to enter where I actually put it. And the same I have to do for plate solve 2. And you could do it with any other of these solutions. On the right side here, you can say how long the exposure should be for plate solving. From my experience, between 5 to 10 seconds gives good results. The filter, I would definitely not leave it at the current because then, for example, you have a dual narrowband filter and that makes it rather hard for the plate solving software to plate solve it because there's less stars. So either I would go with no filter or which is the light pollution filter like I use now. You can also give it a pointing tolerance and a rotation tolerance, which means when will the plate solver actually accept the result and stop slewing again? And for me here, I have two arc minutes. That's good enough. So far so good. We survived this setup round. So now we go from here, from options to equipment. And with equipment, we see all the equipment here. We start always with the camera. So for me, it immediately shows me my camera. It has detected it. It is, by the way, important that all your equipment that you want to activate now here in Nina is already turned on and connected to your computer. So this is the case with my camera. That's how it appears. It appears, by the way, because the ASCOM driver is included in Nina. But I even, as I stated before, installed the ASCOM driver that was actually on the CWO homepage. And you see here both my cameras, which are connected, the, the guide cam and the real cam. And then come some ASCOM drivers, some generic ones. And there's also a simulator. That's also something interesting. For all these equipments, there's always also a simulator. So if you want to start play around with Nina and you don't have your rig close by, you can always choose a simulator and see how it would actually work. If you have connected your camera, it's on, but actually it does not appear here, then this most likely means that you have not installed the ASCOM driver or the camera is not connected, but otherwise it should appear here. So I choose now my CWO and I press here the connect button, takes a moment and then actually it's running. These screens might now look completely different for your camera as depending on your camera, on the ASCOM drivers, other data is shown and other options are there to be changed. So with my ASI, 2600 MC. What I can change down here is the default gain, the default offset, and the USB limit. Up here, the do heater is by default already on. Now I can say I want to cool it down. My target temperature is minus 10 degrees. I could change that. And when I'm actually finished, I could also warm it up again here. Now what you actually can see here with the graph is the temperature, which slowly, slowly goes down now. And here we actually see the cooler power that is needed to cool the camera down. And you can also see up here how the sensor temperature slowly, slowly goes down. We let the camera now cool and we move on. Next is the filter wheel. And by the way, if you do not have certain things here, you just move on. There's no requirement to turn on anything. Also here, my CWO filter wheel is appearing. Otherwise I will actually find it here. Then I switch it on. It always gives you here a success message that you know that something worked or in the other case that it didn't work. So I see now here all the filter names. And if I want to change it, I can do that. Let's go to the Optolong, change, and the filter wheel changes it, and it's done. There's nothing more to do here. So let's move on. The focuser, again, switch on. It's already in there. You see, next success message, the focuser is connected. Also here, I have my target position, the maximum step size, and I can now either with the arrows 
or I can change the target position. I can say it should be 36,000. I say move and it moves and it's done. Next will be a rotator. I do not have a rotator, so I can move on. And now comes the most important part, the telescope or better, the mount. Also here it tells me already my Avalon. Now the telescope is sometimes a little bit more difficult. First of all, a rather complex ASCOM driver is opening up. And second of all, sometimes they have a little bit of synchronization issue. For example, here my telescope thinks we're somewhere different than Nina thinks. And actually, you know, always Nina is right. So here I say I want to sync it from Nina to telescope. So Nina tells now the telescope where we are. And this was successful and now everything is connected. So I could obviously enter here now some manual coordinates and could slew to it, but there's more comfortable ways. We will see that later on. I can park my telescope and I can slew here with this direction button. But at the moment, all that is important is that it is connected. So what comes next? Next comes the guider. So as a guider, I have PHD installed. If it is installed, you can simply press connect and it will automatically open PHD. Success. Obviously, I'm inside, so there's not too many stars inside, but it automatically opens, it automatically connects, and it's ready. Now, when you install PHT, by the way, there's separate tutorials because that again is a rather complex software. So please, if you're new at PHT, take your time, look at in-depth tutorials. But now in relation to Nina, there is one option you have to select in tools here, enable server, because that's needed that Nina and PHD can connect. So with that, we will minimize that and PHD will actually send all its data of the guiding results to Nina. So we don't really have to go in PHD if we don't want to. Next one, switch. And I have a little Pegasus Astro um, power box. I can also turn that on and here we go. So I can actually decide how much my do heater should heat. I can turn off and on the power. And now if you have an automatic flat panel, you could also turn that on. If you have any weather sensor, so you could turn that on the dome control and some safety monitoring. So now we're ready. Let's go back to the camera. Let's see. As you can see, the cooler power is now at 85% and the sensor temperature is at minus 10.3 degrees Celsius. So the camera is ready for usage. So now once we have all turned on, what do we do now? Now let's assume we want to shoot something and in this tutorial we will do everything manually, controlled, so no sequence. This comes later. So we go to the Sky Atlas and we look for something. So it's still the time of Orion. Let's look for it, M42. Here it is. And here you see my customized horizon. Here's my house. That's why on this side <laughs> it's a little bit blocked. And you see it will be already too late for Orion. It almost goes down, but let's anyway, for the sake of it, choose it now. You can now either directly slew to it, or we can say we go to framing assist, and that's what I would recommend. Okay, and here it is. So given that I have actually given the focal lengths, 400 millimeters, the pixel size, it knows how big actually my field of view is. And here is Orion. So now I can obviously say, well, it actually might look better if I put my camera vertically. So let's do that. And yes, you obviously also have to do that now on the rig. So given I have no automatic rotator, I have to do that manually. Then I can also move it. Let's say I want to have this completely down here. Okay. And let's say that's how I want to have it. Now I'm going to say slew and center. And now it's finished with slewing. And now it actually does the plate solving. So it took now an exposure and will now actually compare it if it's really where it should be. Now, obviously we can stop this given in the basement, probably it will not find it, right? <laughs> but it would now compare it. And if it's not correct, then it would re-slew as long until it's 100% correct. Now, the other cool part is 
that we have actually rotated it but are we sure that now with also the, the angle the telescope has with the equatorial mount that we're really in this angle if we want to know we can press here determine rotation from camera it will again take an exposure and plate solve it and then show it exactly in which angle it really is and so if that's not what we wanted we can then actually correct the rotation on the telescope and try this for as long until we really have it the way rotated that we want to make the exposure once we have done that we go to imaging and now the imaging section is really our huge control center no matter if you do it now manually or if you would run actually a sequence this is where we constantly check or in a sequence when we want to if everything runs the way we want so we have here a camera section we can influence the cooling we see the cooler power the sensor temperature we see here the filter and we can change it for example now that we're at orion we arrived we could actually change the filter to the antlia then we have here the focuser let's assume we're not using autofocus we can actually simply move it here with the Batinov mask until it's correct. We see exactly where the telescope is pointing to. We have here some monitoring of the HFR so that we see if our star size is getting smaller or bigger. We have some additional statistics. And in the middle here, we have the main window where we actually see then the effective pictures. We can obviously make them bigger, make them smaller. We can use auto stretch or not. And in the bottom part here, we can switch to other things. For example, autofocus. We can do here plate solving, and we can even do here a polar alignment. In the bottom part here, we see the guiding, but the most important part here is now this area, if we shoot without a sequence. Because here I can now say exposure time, for example, 10 seconds. This is the filter I want to use, spinning, and now I just say loop it, save it, and then it actually will take pictures. By the way, this whole field here is completely customizable. So you can add here as much information or as less information as you want. You can move each of these tiles to another place, give it as much space as you feel that is needed. So this setup is completely up to you. And that's obviously another one of the great features of Nina that I have this possibility. Now, once we have actually made our pictures, now we can actually stop cooling and we can actually warm the camera again. And this time we deconnect everything else. And when we have done that, we can actually exit okay and that was it for part one so you're now at the stage where you can actually install nina and play around with it and use it in a manual mode and take some shots in part two we will look at the sequences how to create them to use them and to modify them and in part three we will look at some advanced modification you can do in nina and at the plugins to make sure that you not miss part two and three please subscribe to my channel or even better, join my Patreon page and then you get it earlier than anybody else and without commercials. And on my Patreon page, I will also add some templates for sequences as well as some written documents of what we have covered right now. See you next time and clear skies.